Welcome to my series of short podcasts about the stories of the Tudors. My name is Tony Riches and I'm a historical fiction author from Pembrokeshire in Wales. And I'm a specialist in the history of the early Tudors. In this series I'm talking about the wives of King Henry VIII and this time I'm looking at the life of Queen Jane Seymour. Now Jane features in my current work in progress about Lady Catherine Willoughby. So um, I've gone back to what I thought I knew about her life and I've discovered a few interesting things during my research. Uh, so John Seymour, the third wife of King Henry VIII, is often portrayed as being shy and perhaps even boring and described by many as the opposite of Anne Boleyn. So whereas Anne was vivacious and um, attention-seeking, uh, then Jane is characterised as being passive and quite introvert. But of course, it's no surprise to discover that the truth is far more complex. And interestingly, Jane Seymour's short reign was right in the middle of the often chaotic events of the Reformation of religion in England. And she really must have wrestled with her conscience as she was a devout Catholic at the time that the Church of England was being established. One chronicler of the time said that Jane was the most beautiful of all Henry's wives, saying that when she put on her queenly regalia, no woman was more beautiful. But others describe her as really quite pale and actually some go as far as say unattractive. And it's interesting to look at the famous portrait of her and wonder which of them was telling the truth. Like Anne Boleyn, Jane was born in the early 16th century in a family which had good royal connections and uh, the Seymours were important enough for Jane to be sent to Henry's court and both Anne Boleyn and Jane Seymour could have served as ladies-in-waiting to Queen Catherine of Aragon at the same time. And of course then Jane moved on from serving Catherine to serving Anne. So she'd seen um, how it worked for Queens of Henry VIII. Um, one of the interesting questions is, did this um, shy girl become Henry's mistress before becoming his wife? There's no evidence that I've found to say that she did, except the speculation of courtiers, but that was always going on, I think. And the fact of the matter is that both Anne and Jane were being used by their families to win the king's favour. It was one of the easiest ways, I suppose, if you had an attractive daughter and you wanted your family to rise in importance, then you just had to make sure that uh, she was one of his wife's ladies-in-waiting. But you do have to wonder if Jane Seymour had any say in it. I, I recently re-watched the really quite wonderful BBC adaptation of Wolf Hall, which covers uh, both of Henry Mantel's books, uh, Wolf Hall and Bring Up the Bodies. And... Uh, We've got, of course, uh, it's quite complicated, we've got Thomas Cromwell's perception uh, filtered through Hilary Mantel's pen of Henry's uh, visit to Wolf Hall and his meetings with Jane. But it does give you a flavour of how it might have been. And um, it's, it's thought that 
Jane learnt from Anne Boleyn, she would have been watching um, the effect on Henry when Anne Boleyn refused the king's advances <laughs> and uh, probably thought it was best to do the same. And of course, she had the benefit of being able to cite religious grounds. And as a devoted Catholic, Jane Seymour also had a lot of appeal to the almost disenfranchised factions who worried about the consequences of the king's reforms to religion. And um, in January 1536, when Queen Catherine of Aragon died and um, Anne Boleyn unfortunately suffered a miscarriage, the whole idea of Henry VIII uh, wanting a new wife uh, became a real possibility. And it, it seems that Jane did her best to protect her reputation. And when the king gave her presents, um, it said that he gave her a purse of money, which is a bit of an odd present. Um, but she made a, a great show of sort of falling to her knees and um, kissing the the king's seal on the letter that came with it and returning the gift um, allegedly explaining that she could only receive a gift of money from a gentleman uh, who'd promised her marriage now that seems a bit far-fetched to me uh, but it's a good story and Henry seemed to like this uh, just as he had with Anne Boleyn um, he liked uh, these ladies that were a little bit hard to get and um, he had a clever idea which is he had all the rooms switched around in his palace so that he could visit Jane Seymour through a private corridor connecting their bedrooms so once again this does give rise to speculation that she might have she might not have been his mistress but as close to it as um, she dared we don't, of course, have any record of what Jane Seymour thought about the dreadful circumstances around the trial and execution of Anne Boleyn. She didn't seem to write very much, and when we do wonder if she was terribly well educated, because uh, she seems to have spent most of her time doing needlework rather than writing letters and things like that. But the facts are that she was betrothed to Henry the day after Anne's execution, and they were married um, on May the 29th, shortly afterwards. And Jane Seymour was proclaimed Queen of England on June the 4th. So if she really uh, didn't think it was right what happened to Anne, I think she could have uh, continued playing hard to get but it seems she didn't continue for very long. Interestingly, Jane Seymour's credited with encouraging Henry VIII to reconcile with his strange daughter, Princess Mary. And um, this is something, a lot of people seem to have the credit for this, because I'm also researching um, the story of Catherine Parr, and she's also credited with doing a lot to reconcile the king with both of his estranged daughters. Um, but it does seem that um, Jane would have been similar in age to Princess Mary and uh, they would have shared their Catholic faith. So perhaps she saw Mary as a, um, a spiritual as well as a um, family friend technically. Uh, Mary would be her stepdaughter, but of course that's a bit of a nonsense. But poor Mary, of course, had been removed from the line of succession and pretty much forced to agree that her own parents' marriage had been invalid, which meant that she was illegitimate. And um, that also meant that any children Jane Seymour had would take priority over Mary and, of course, the infant Elizabeth. Then, during the autumn of 1536, uh, a massive rebellion broke out against Henry VIII's strategy of dissolving the monasteries and convents and turning them into cash. Uh, he also 
uh, raised the rents in York, which was a fatal mistake. The Northerners didn't appreciate that one bit. And uh, one of the ringleaders, um, a young lawyer called Robert Ask, unfortunately for Jane, was her cousin. And uh, it's said that Henry reminded Jane what had happened to his other wives who had meddled in his affairs. I don't really think she would have needed much reminding. But uh, poor Robert Ask was tricked into coming all the way to London to agree terms with the king. And then, next thing we know, he's being hung in chains in York. Um, something of a martyr to the cause. But Jane, of course, survived all of that, and Henry founded two new monasteries in her honour. Jane's coronation as Queen of England was postponed by all these religious riots and an outbreak of the plague. So she never was crowned as Queen, which is interesting, but she was accepted as Queen, it seems, by everybody, and took her role very seriously. And no one seemed to question her, her right to be on the throne at the side of Henry VIII. And Jane brought to the court her own views in terms of um, how things should be conducted in a very conservative way, which harks back to the approach taken by Queen Catherine of Aragon, and quite opposite to Anne Boleyn, which perhaps is where this whole idea of Jane being the opposite to Anne came about. Because whereas Anne happily brought all the French fashions and the French hood in place of the gable hood to the court, to the English court from France, um, Jane reversed those and actually made it, uh, she banned the whole idea of wearing any French fashions and played up to Henry's dislike of the French and his distrust of anything French. And so the difference between the two queens um, is, is quite pronounced. In fact, if you look at their mottos, um, Anne's motto was the most happy, and Jane's motto was bound to obey and serve, uh, which is quite a different way of looking at things. Um, Jane's most important duty was to provide the king with healthy sons who would become heirs. And luckily for her, she became pregnant in early 1537. I say luckily, um, perhaps it wasn't all that lucky, um, but better that than to have been um, like poor uh, Queen Catherine of Aragon. Um, suffering a series of miscarriages and uh, never giving the king the healthy air that he, he longed for. So Joan spent the whole of the summer um, basically not doing anything as far as we could tell, uh, just staying out of the public view and concentrating on uh, making sure her pregnancy would be a success. So when she finally went into her formal confinement, it was mid-September, the whole country celebrated with um, parties and bonfires and services of thanksgiving, which perhaps seemed a little bit premature. But as we know, her labour was a bit of a nightmare in that it lasted for two long nights and three days before she was actually delivered of a son, Prince Edward, on October the 9th. Now, I've got a theory here, which I can't back up, but if you put yourself in the place of Henry VIII, um, and the doctors would have consulted him and said, if, if he asked them, uh, he, they would have had to tell him that there was a risk to his child's life, unless they took fairly drastic action. Now, they knew all about um, caesarean section. Um, obviously, that's why it's called caesarean. But the, their techniques were really quite wanting. And, of course, they had very little understanding of infection control. So, although it is very likely 
that Jane Seymour died of um, an infection brought on by this very protracted um, delivery and uh, she might have been weakened and um, succumbed to some illness or whatever. Uh, it is also a possibility that there could have been um, a rather desperate last minute attempt to save the child. Uh, they would have done their best to save the Queen at the same time, um, but we, one can only imagine how that might have been. Anyway, at the New Prince's christening on October the 15th, um, both Princess Mary and Princess Elizabeth, who was a, pretty much a toddler at the time, helped to carry his train, which was yards of, of uh, material. <laughs> and in fact, um, Elizabeth was so small, she had to be carried as well. Um, but it, it was a, a strange, it seems strange to us these days, but a strange tradition that uh, the mother uh, didn't attend the christening. Christenings tended to take place as soon as they could, really. And of course, the mother was uh, really um, confined until she'd been churched. So that's, uh, there's, that's where that originates from. But what she did do was to um, thank the courtiers who'd uh, attended the ceremony. And it's documented that they thought... Uh, she looked rather unwell, and um, in my current work in progress about um, Charles Brandon's wife, Catherine Willoughby Brandon, Duchess of Suffolk, um, I had she was present at that meeting, and um, I had to see it through her eyes, and she would have been very aware of the long, sad history of mothers dying. Um, pretty soon after childbirth and so it wasn't really any big surprise but um, Jane Seymour was actually given the last rites on October the 17th and uh, it's said that her health briefly improved and they thought everything was going to be okay and then of course sadly she died on October the 24th so she did suffer quite a lot at the end one would imagine and um, I hate to imagine what kind of remedies they would have tried to keep her alive. But um, at her funeral, it, it was quite a special funeral because Princess Mary was the chief mourner and she was followed by 29 other mourners, um, each one representing a year of the Queen's life. And unlike... Um, Queen Catherine of Aragon, or Anne Boleyn, of course, uh, Jane was given a full state funeral at St George's Chapel in Windsor Castle. And I visited there uh, last year. And it's just amazing to um, envisage how that would have been and to stand on the very spot. And it just I just find it incredible that that's still possible to do, that you can... Just go to Windsor, go to St George's Chapel and stand there on the very spot where um, Jane Seymour was buried. One of the wives that followed her would have the same honour and um, it said that uh, above her tomb it was inscribed Here lieth a phoenix by whose death another phoenix life gave breath. Is to be lamented much, the world at once never knew to such. Jane was married to Henry VIII for a year and a half, and the king would always speak of her as his most loved wife. Not terribly sensitive for her successors, I suppose, but never mind. Um, it said that he was in mourning for three months after her death, and of course he didn't marry again for three years, which is quite a long time by Henry VIII's standards and when Henry died he was buried uh, beside Jane Seymour in St George's Chapel at his request perhaps not in quite the grand tomb that he would have wished um, but at least uh, they're together for eternity and Jane had seen Catherine and Anne destroyed by their dramatic personalities 
and it's it's really got to be true that she had an instinct for survival and is remembered for being kind-hearted and well-intentioned and well-behaved and a woman that i think deserves better than just to be remembered as the shy one who died in childbirth because she did change the history of england and of course her son the crown prince edward um, had equally a big impact on the history of england in his short life if you'd like to discover more behind the known facts about jane seymour i recommend alison weir's novel in his in a series six children queens um, it's called jane seymour the haunted queen i shan't give away why she says that but i always enjoy looking at the author's notes at the back of alison's books it's a, it's a thing i've started doing myself is putting an author's note at the back of each book and uh, alison says uh, historians endlessly debate whether or not Jane was the demure and virtuous willing instrument of an ambitious family and an ardent and powerful king, or whether she was ambitious as her relations and played a proactive part in bringing down the queen she served. It is impossible, given the paucity of the evidence, to reach a conclusion. And yet a novelist approaching Jane Seymour must opt for one view or the other. For me, this posed the challenge which set me poring once more over the historical evidence on which this book is based, looking for clues as how to portray her. What we know about Jane Seymour, apart from the bare facts of her story, is that at the outset of the dissolution, she pleaded for the monasteries to be restored. So this places her firmly in the traditionalist camp, as does the fact that she served Catherine of Aragon for some years and probably stayed with her for some time after Catherine had been banished from court. So that's all I'm going to say about Jane Seymour in this podcast. But um, in the next podcast, I'll be looking at her successor, uh, the rather curious story of Anne of Cleves. Links to all of my books can be found on my website at tonyriches.com and thank you for listening.